sharing. I'm going to share my screen so you can all see the slideshow that I've prepared. We can see it. Okay. So I just did a similar presentation with my students at Westchester University today. Um, I should say and I'm a resident of Lincoln Village since 2019. So, and they all really appreciated it. And it, as Sherry pointed out, it was very much appreciated at the community center last week. So I'm looking forward to doing this with you all here tonight. Um, I also would like to point out that behind me, I have a lovely South African sunset which always puts me in a good mood. So fake news, real news, who can tell? And I'm gonna talk with you today about recognizing and avoiding election scams. I don't know about you, but I get 10, 15 things in my mail and text messages every day. So uh, the problem of fake news is not a new issue. Back in 1893, William James wrote that there is no concrete test of what is really true. So, and, and it's never been agreed on. And we still have that problem today, determining what's really true. So my, my goal here is to help you all better determine that. So this is, uh, this came in an actual uh, message to somebody, looks very official, request your mail-in ballot. Don't click anything on here. This, the slide didn't change. It didn't? Nope. All right. There you go. Okay. So you see the the scam slide now? Yes. Okay. So this looks official. It's not, it's a scam. It's designed to data mine you. Uh, don't click anything on it. Um, you can see that. So if this was the official voter registration services, it wouldn't have anything related to any specific political party. It does in this case. Um, the correct people that would be, that you would contact would be the Chester County election officials at chesco.org. Any other address is not a safe address to interact with over your mail-in ballot or checking whether or not you're registered. So if you have concerns, you get a message like this and it causes you to feel concerned, you should go around the message, don't use their links, and instead go directly to the Chester County election official office at chesco.org. Here's another actual message. This came over email. This again is looking for information about whether or not you're registered. Again, the only official um, people who would send something like that to you would be the election office in Chester County. There's a number of suspicious things here on this message, which I'm gonna point out to you. So it's sent by confirmation missing from a suspicious address, administrator at estoprepublicans.com. So there's the address, that is a strange address. It is not an official Chester County Elections Office address. The Chester County Elections Office wouldn't send you an email anyway, but we should be concerned about this email. If you get a message and you're not sure who the email is from, you can simply copy the email address paste it into a, a Google search box, Google it, they'll tell you whose it is, which is exactly what I did. And it told me that this is, a, this is a, a, a group of scammers. It's got a bunch of things for you to click. Don't click. Don't click this link that says unsubscribe. It won't unsubscribe, unsubscribe you. It'll data mine you. It'll steal your data. Don't click any of these things down here. Don't click that. They have lots of things for you to click. Clicking is how they get your information, how the viruses get on your computer. 
So AARP identified that very address as a scam. In 2016, this group, a PAC, was set up by Kyle Gerald Prawl. He raised half a million dollars on behalf of both Republicans and Democrats. So you can see he's he's not concerned about party affiliation. In order to meet the requirements as a PAC, he had to spend money on the candidates, which he did. He spent less than a penny on the dollar on political causes. So that means if someone contributed $20, you know, hoping to support their favorite candidate, he only contributed 20 cents. So this was a money-making operation for him. He kept the rest of the money. Total scam. There's lots of reasons why people run these kinds of scams. One of them is prestige. And it's as, as old as people have been communicating with each other. So here's a nice example from you, for you. Very old cave painting. Right? And in this cave painting, this is a hunting scene, as many cave paintings are. In this case, the hunter represented right there in the red circle, the little stick guy, he, the, he is hunting. What it says in the caption is a miniature buffalo, miniature being the operative word here, uh, called an Anoa. So here's our hunter, and here is our miniature buffalo. There's nothing miniature about this buffalo. In fact, if I was hunting a miniature buffalo and I confronted this, I would run. I wouldn't try to shoot it. But you can see there's a bunch of lines pointing into it that probably represent spears or arrows or something. So, but this is probably, you know, what we've called a uh, fishtail, you know, where somebody catches a fish this big and tells everybody it was this big. So this is probably a fishtail. It's a misrepresentation of what actually happened on the hunt. And it makes the hunter seem like a really tough guy. He caught the giant, the giant miniature buffalo. Another common motive is money. So in 1555 in Florence, Italy, uh, this guy convinces the Duke that he knows how to make gold. The Duke likes this idea pays him 20,000 ducats, and then the guy skips town and heads to France. So making money like our, like our scam guy earlier. Sometimes the motive is influence. In the 16th century in Rome, um, a person who was trying to influence the election of a pope created what they call wicked sonnets. So these were fake news poems about the candidate for pope, which he plastered all over town, including on this bust of a person by the name of Pasquino. And so these wicked sonnets became known as Pasquinades. In the 17th and 18th centuries in France, they had canards. And that's a word that we have in English. Uh, these were pamphlets that were sold on the streets of Pam uh, Paris. They were filled with misinformation. For instance, one issue of a canard talks about a giant that was captured and killed, like, uh, you know, Shrek kind of giant, a giant that was captured and killed in Chile. So it was filled with all kinds of fake news and misinformation. During the French Revolution, the, uh, these canards contained information about the royal family, including a lot that was aimed at Marie Antoinette. Historians believe that this, these canards played a significant role in fomenting hatred for her, and then ultimately in her and her being executed. There's my source. Uh, fake news is also designed to create chaos and confusion. So in this year's elections, um, the, the state of Iran seems to be the most active um, international player in our elections. And what they're really interested in is af affecting national security. So they've been hacking all of the campaigns. They've hacked the Trump campaign. They've hacked the Biden campaign. They've hacked the Harris campaign. They're also using social media, uh, specific, in particular, a a social media messaging app called WhatsApp. And WhatsApp is a, a favorite app among younger people. So they've been targeting students in particular. 
in order to stoke, um, uh, you know, uh, animosity and um, uh, get the students riled up about the war in Gaza, which is a horrible thing. But they're specifically organizing, trying to get students to organize against it to create unrest here in the United States. They really could care less about who wins. They've hacked all the campaigns. They, what they care about is destabilizing our society. So, And they've even gone as far, not just sending out fake news on social media, but they've even gone as far as hiring people to pose as students and give money to student organizations in order to support the protests. So you're on the internet, in your email, on your television, things are often not as they appear. We need to be vigilant about uh, being aware of disinformation and fake news. Technology these days makes it a lot easier for, uh, for us to be tricked, particularly with the advancements in artificial intelligence, where they can fake people's voices, they can fake people's images. If they had enough pictures of me, they could you know, make a video of me doing or saying something that I never did or said before in my life. So detecting fake news and misinformation, according to the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is a, a, a monthly publication that's written for professors and administrators at universities, what we all need to learn is civic online reasoning. I went to the Stanford University website and to their civic online reasoning program, which they call CORE, and this is what they say we all need to learn. We need to learn what they call lateral reading. That means you leave a website or you leave the email or the text message that you're looking at and you look at other sources on the same topic. You can do that through a Google search. What you're trying to do is find sources that you are already familiar with that you know you can rely on to see if it corroborates the information in the message or on the website that you're looking at. If you get corroboration, that would make you feel more confident in it. If you don't get corroboration, then that would make you feel less confident in that information. They say that we should question who is behind the information. What are their credentials? Why do they want you to know this information? Why are they sharing it with you? And you can check this by going on their website or searching their names in a Google search. And I'll give you an example for, from one of my students. It's sort of an innocuous example, but she was doing research on early childhood education. And she found what to her seemed to be like a super awesome website on early childhood education. And so I asked her, who is this information coming from and what are their credentials? So as she tells me, the website was is owned by Mary R. Teacher and John Q. Educator. And I was like, really? And she says, yeah. And I said, doesn't that seem a little odd to you? She goes, no. I said, you figure out who they are. So she tries to figure out who they are. She can't find them. And I said, there's no reason why anybody Talking about early childhood education should disguise their identity. It's not reliable. You need to move on to something else. You also want to examine the evidence that they're using to support whatever claim they're making. Can that information be verified? I just said to my students today, somebody tells you pigs can fly. AI can make pigs fly. Can you find any solid evidence that pigs can actually fly? Does it come from a reliable source, the one that you already know and can trust? Finally, you want to look for anomalies, things that seem a bit off. Hyperbolic claims that are designed to provo provoke strong emotions in you are a cause for suspicion. Websites with no authors or weird authors, like the example that I gave you, are also a cause for concern. Odd URLs, which is the web address. Those can also be a clue that you're not looking at what you think you're looking at. So my students found at what seemed to them to be an ABC News website. But when I asked them to look at the URL, it wasn't abcnews.com. It was abcnews.nt. So it was designed to look like ABC News, but it wasn't ABC News. 
So even the students who are more tech savvy, supposedly, than we are, have to be taught to look for these things. So um, I've been getting my information up about uh, some of these things from Cal California Technical University. So, and this is how you read a URL. So the first part, it tells us, you know, the, the internet protocol, it's not useful or interesting and many web browsers don't even show that information to you. So you can ignore that. What comes next is what's important. This tells you the domain name or who owns this uh, this website, in this case, the California Institute of Technology. So this is the information you want to focus on. Does that look like what it's supposed to look like? Do, if I think I'm looking at the California uh, Institute of Technology, does this web address look like that? Does it end in an EDU? It has to be an educational institution to end in an EDU. If it ends in a .com or a .net or a dot .anything else, that's a cause for suspicion. This extra information tells you which specific page on the website that you're looking at. If you think of a web page as like a book, if you keep a website as being like a book, the stuff at the end is the name of a chapter in the book. The, the part that comes before it is the name of the book. So scammers can alter domain names to trick you, as I had said before. So .edu is for education, but not all education institutions are created equally. .gov is for government only. .org is for nonprofit organizations. Some are more scrupulous than others. .com and .net are com commercial enterprises. So a scammer can take the domain name, right, right here that I circled for you before, that belongs to Caltech, and change it to .work or .tk and thereby trick people into thinking that they're looking at the Caltech website when they're really not. So we really want to pay attention to those URLs, those web addresses. I want us to look at an example together. And I think this is an example that many of you will feel familiar with. I want us to, we're going to look at it for a minute. I'm going to blow up a portion of it for you. And then I'd like people, I'd like to talk for a minute about what we see. So this is not the legitimate New York Times, although it looks very much like it. It's laid out like the New York Times. It uses the head mast that you would see, the masthead that you would see on the New York Times, right? The that, you know, the type, they use the right font. Everything looks like the New York Times if you just glance at it quickly. I want us to focus on the masthead for a minute. So here's the masthead. I hope it's big enough for you all to see. And if you just take a minute and look at it and then tell me what you see, of, if anything, that you think looks strange. Uh, it's not the way it should be. You can unmute yourself to answer. Yeah, so anybody who sees anything, just unmute yourself. You can do that by clicking on the microphone at the bottom of your screen, or you can hit the space, hold the space bar down on your computer, and that will unmute you. Well, it says that strong left, leftward winds. <laughs> As, and that is not the direction that wind comes from, right? Right. The students, I have to explain this to. I'll say, does that seem strange to you? And they're like, no. What direction does the wind come from? Well, sometimes it comes from the left. Sometimes it comes in front. Sometimes it comes in back. <laughs> like, no, no, no. We don't use if you change if you just turn around, then it's all coming from a different direction, right? So instead, it would come from you know points on the compass: north, south, east, west. Other things that people notice? How about all the news that's that's fit to print? Instead, it says all the news we hope to print. Okay, very good. Other things that seem strange? Should say New York, New York. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yeah. And do you have the uh, place to sign up for free? It says free. 
It says free. Have you any of you ever seen a free New York Times? <laughs> I don't think such a thing exists. No. So <laughs> this is a parody. It's a parody of the New York Times. Parody is protected political speech. Um, they're leaving Easter eggs for you to find that that shows that it's not legitimate, even though it looks very much like it's legitimate. They're doing this because they're trying to make a point about things. They have articles in there about, you know, having a sane economy. Um, and it was published in 2009 when the Iraq war was in, you know, full swing and they were announcing that the Iraq war was ending or it had ended. So they were trying to make a trying to make a point and doing so by creating this parody New York Times. They actually printed up an entire edition of this parody New York Times, multiple pages, and handed it out for free at, as people were getting out of subways in New York City. But these are the kinds of details that you want to look at when you're looking at a website. Anything that seems strange it is cause for concern. And parody helps us learn what to look at because they're deliberately leaving us Easter eggs. They don't want to deceive us. And so looking at parodies of things can help us develop the skills we need in order to detect things that are actually trying to scam or cheat or lie to us. So um, this comes from a, a political parody group called the Yes Men. As I just said, they left Easter eggs. I've got here for you their website if you wanted to go see some more of their projects. But this is what they do. They make political parodies. So as I mentioned, voter fraud, it's just that they're, they're designed to gain influence, steal your data, make money. According to the AARP, you should avoid the following types of election scams. First, voter registration scams. One of those um, messages at the beginning was a voter registration scam. If someone claims you're not registered to vote, do not interact with them. You go directly to the Chester County Elections Office. And I have a slide that has all of the, ad the correct addresses to use. AI generated robocalls. As I mentioned earlier, they can impersonate anybody's voice or anybody's image. These, these calls will, you know, impersonate people that you would recognize. So often they'll use celebrities' voices. I know I get text messages every day from, you know, people claiming to be celebrities. Um, they're not celebrities text messaging, right? They, so they often share false information about when and where to vote. Don't take their word for it. Instead, watch for the Hershey's Mill News for announcements on your designated voting location. We all vote here at Hershey's Mill, either at the golf club or at the community center. If you're concerned about or confused about when to vote or where to vote, you can watch for these for this news announcement, or you can go to the Chester County Elections Office. They also say to watch out for donation scams. These scammers use texts, emails, robocalls to get you to contribute money. Don't click the links and don't give money over the phone. Instead, go directly to the website of your chosen candy, candidate or party or organization. Or if you want to check on a, an organization that's looking for you to contribute, the Federal Election Commission has a list of all the official political action committees. And you can go there and look for the name of whatever organization is asking you for money before you give money to them. And they said to avoid, ARP says to avoid fake surveys, petitions, and polls. They use texts, emails, and robocalls to ask you about how you will vote. They may offer incentives like gift cards. These are attempts to steal your personal information. They're data mining you. Don't click the link or answer the questions over the phone unless you are very certain about who you're interacting with. And I've got on the next slide information about who to contact that is reliable. So uh, here's important contact information. So the Chester County Voter Services, if you're concerned about, am I registered? Where do I vote? 
when do I vote, any of those kinds of things, you go to the Chester County Voter Services. Here is their email address, their phone number, and their website. The Federal Elections Commission, they have, as I mentioned, information on political action committees and other legitimate organizations, and this is their web address. Note it's a .gov. Uh, which is all, only government agencies can have. And then finally, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Voting and Election Information website. They have lots of information about when, where, why, how to vote. And here is their address. And again, note that it's a .gov. Not, and it's a, so it's a PA.gov. So you know it's a Pennsylvania government site. So in conclusion, this has been a problem going back centuries. And here Socrates is talking about um, fake information. So he says, don't you know that people are voluntarily deprived of bad things, but involuntarily deprived of good ones? And isn't being deceived about the truth a bad thing while possessing the truth is good? Or don't you think that to believe the things that are is to possess the truth? You know, Socrates used that questioning method. So I hope today I helped you all possess a little bit more of the truth and feel better empowered to deal with the onslaught of election stuff that's coming our way. Thank you very much for listening. And if anybody wants to talk about anything, ask any questions, I'm really happy to, to continue talking with people, but I'm going to stop sharing.